Hey guys, welcome back to Checkerboard Chat, the official sports podcast of the Daily Beacon. I'm Blake Von Hagen, the sports editor. He's Will Backus, the assistant sports editor. We're here to recap the Georgia game. Well, it feels like we haven't really been home from Athens too long, uh, but have you had time to process the game and come up with any, any takeaways from that game? Well, I mean, yeah, I've had time. We haven't been back a whole long. got back 2 a.m. this morning, so... Um, but yeah, there's been time to process it. You look at the score on paper, 38-12, to 12, doesn't look like a great game for Tennessee, but they fared a lot better than I think a majority of people thought they would, and 14 of those 38 points kind of came in, well, a touchdown of that came in garbage time, then another one of those came kind of in the fourth quarter uh, to put the game a little bit out of reach for Tennessee, but it was... I think it was a positive game for Tennessee, even though they lost 38-12. to They, you know, showed a little bit more fight than I think they did in the Florida game. They played a lot cleaner than they did in the Florida game. No turnovers, which is a huge um, improvement. Uh, if it wasn't for a few unlucky breaks in the first half, then you think that game will probably be pretty close, even coming down to the, you know, final bell. Yeah, and it really couldn't have started out any, any more poorly than it did for Tennessee. You have that 15-yard opening run for Ty Chandler. They don't get anything out of that on offense. And then defensively, uh, Taylor comes in with the strip sack. It's picked up by a tight end, run back for a touchdown somehow for Georgia. And, you know, after the game, Pruitt said he's never seen anything like that before. It's been a year of firsts for him. And he said that was one of those firsts. And, but after that, I mean, Georgia kind of handles it in the first half. They're up 24 nothing going to halftime. And then Tennessee comes back in the second half, cuts it to 24-12, to miss on a couple two-point conversions. But overall, Tennessee was able to get back in the game, which I, I don't think Georgia was expecting that. Right. Uh, in the first half, the offense definitely struggled. Didn't put any points up on the board. Only got 68 total yards. Um, Garantano was 6 of 10 for 38 yards, I think. And then or for 30 yards, or, and uh, the running backs ran for a total of, you know, 38 yards. So it was not a great offensive first half for Tennessee, but the defense really stuck in there, even when they were put in tough positions, when the offense wasn't really, you know, doing a great job of not, not even moving the ball well. Um, it wasn't the case of them moving the ball and just not scoring. They just weren't, you know, moving the ball well, multiple three and outs. But the defense held Georgia for three for seven on third downs in the first half. Um, you look at the score, they're down 17-0, to zero, um, but the defense, I think, just did an overall great job. Daryl Taylor, specifically, he had probably his best game uh, as you know at Tennessee. Uh, two sacks in the first half, both of them fumbles, so they technically go down as, you know, they're technically sacks, but they won't, uh, they aren't necessarily on the record. Um, but he was just kind of manhandling um, the edge, and it's funny, on the, on the, the tight end fumble recovery for a touchdown, the Isaac Nada, the guy that recovered the fumble, was the guy that Daryl Taylor blew up to get to the strip sack. So it was just kind of one of those fluke plays. And if you take that away, then it's just 10-0 at the half. So Tennessee, Georgia got a couple pretty lucky breaks, two fumbles in the first half that they both recovered. So they got a, they got, they got a couple pretty lucky breaks, but Tennessee's defense as a whole had a very nice game. Yeah, and Taylor's a guy that's been a fan favorite since that Virginia Tech game. He has some choice words before the Battle of Bristol that kind of went viral for him. And, um, you know, he's kind of been quiet since then, but he really had a breakout game. It was a career high in sacks for him with his three sacks. And after the game, he said that his teammates have been helping him, his coach has been helping him, and he was just happy to see that come to fruition in that game. And he'll be a guy that Tennessee needs to continue to bring that pressure because they haven't been bringing pressure. Yesterday, I think they did a better job of, of bringing pressure than they have been in in games past. Well, if you look at it, I think their pass rush has gotten consistently better because it went from their season opener against West Virginia to where they could barely get in the backfield, maybe with the exception of a couple plays. And you have ETSU and UTEP where, again, they kind of struggle to get sacks. But then they come out against Florida, and they've got um, guys like Alexis Johnson and Kyle Phillips who both record a sack. And they got to Felipe Franks quite a few times and made him a little bit of uncomfortable. Of course, that Florida game as a whole was just a bad game for Tennessee. And then Georgia, uh, Daryl Taylor specifically going out back there and being in the backfield, getting three sacks. And then a couple other defensive linemen like Alexis Johnson, uh, they were in the backfield quite a few times disrupting plays. So I think they're doing a better job of getting to the quarterback and applying pressure. Daniel Batulli said after the game that he, he sees the progress uh, throughout each game and he thinks that they're getting better at applying pressure to the quarterback. So we'll see if that comes into fruition. Uh, if they continue to improve, and if guys like Daryl Taylor can keep up that consistent production because Tennessee will really need it. Yeah, and while Georgia's known for their for their dynamic you know, rushing attack, 
they did run for over 200 yards in that game. But overall, I think Tennessee's de defense did a pretty good job. And you got to note that the defense was on the field for 37 minutes. So when you're on the field for 37 minutes, you're going to wear down. You're going to give up some big plays. But overall, it's, it's what you can do to limit the, the production for Georgia's run game. And so I think Tennessee did a good job of that. And um, guys, yeah, guys like Taylor, and if they can continue to bring pressure, then that's going to force uh, – force teams into making bad decisions. You're gonna get some strip sacks and eventually you're gonna get lucky enough to, to pick up a ball. I mean, they had four four fumbles for Georgia and Tennessee doesn't get one of them. Eventually the odds are gonna go your way and you're gonna pick some of those up. So uh, Tennessee can continue to do a good job of that. I, I think that will, will really help them out. Right, and like you mentioned, four fumbles and none of them picked up. That's just, it's it's partially bad luck. Some people might cite poor effort, cite poor effort, but it's really hard to pick up the fumble on a strip sack because usually you've only got one guy out there stripping the ball, and he ends up on the ground. And then Georgia has, you know, offensive linemen and tight end that were already tight ends that were already in the backfield, or even the quarterback. So it's really hard to recover those kinds of fumbles. But if Tennessee can keep pressure in the quarterback, they will have their breaks come their way, whether it be another strip sack or forcing the quarterback to make a you know, a, a bad decision and throw the ball downfield and it gets picked off. So pressuring the quarterback is one of the most important uh, facets of the pass game, not just good coverage, but getting to the quarterback so the quarterback doesn't have time to sit there and pick you apart. And so if Tennessee can improve on that, who knows what their defense might be able to achieve. Yeah, and overall it just, it didn't really look like Georgia's offense ever got into a rhythm. I mean, part of that might've been that they're rotating Jake Fromm and Justin Fields seemed like they were doing that almost every play, which didn't really make much sense to me. You're, you're not, a guy's not going to get in the rhythm when you're, when you're doing that. But the thing it did do is Justin Fields comes in the game and he picked up a couple, you know, seven, 10 yard rushes on the outside, which Jake Fromm doesn't bring that dynamic to their offense. So he was able to get around the outside there and pick up some big third downs when Tennessee did cut the, cut the lead down to 24 to 12. It didn't feel like Tennessee was in the game, but 12 point game, you're right there, two touchdowns and you have the lead over the number two team in the country. So they were definitely in the game, but Georgia you know, put their foot on the pedal and that's what good teams do. That's what you expect out of a number two team in the country playing at home. Right, they put together that long uh, drive right there to go up 31 to 12 that went seven minutes and 39 seconds. And that drained a lot of time off the clock. And then they score. They did a great job of running ball. That was probably their best drive of the day, uh, and especially on the ground game because they they had three third downs on that drive and two of them were converted on the ground game by uh, Brian Harrion, who really just kind of entered the game at that point and took over. So it was, a, it was a pretty hard drive for Tennessee's defense, but as you mentioned, they were on the field for about you know, 25, 30 minutes to that point total. So it's really hard for you to kind of have your back against the wall in that situation. But 24-12, it was a close game. It kind of felt at some point like Tennessee had a little bit of momentum but Georgia did a good job of shutting that down, which is what you expect again from the number two team in the nation. Yeah, and there were some missed opportunities for Tennessee there where they could have made it an even closer game. You have the Nigel Warrior that drops an interception that he probably should have caught. He, I know he wishes he had caught that ball. Uh, and then obviously the fumbles that Tennessee wasn't able to recover any of those. And then the, the fumble that goes for a touchdown, not only do you not recover it, but it goes for a touchdown the other way. So any one of those plays, any combination of those plays, and maybe the game was even closer or maybe just Georgia got complacent when they're up 24 nothing and wasn't really expecting much out of a Tennessee offense that has showed struggles in weeks past. So maybe they just weren't expecting Tennessee to put up points, but you have to give credit to Tennessee's offense where Ty Chandler had a, had a pretty standout game um, with that catch he had over the middle, makes a nice cut and runs all the way for a touchdown uh, to pull Tennessee within 24 to 12. Right, Tennessee's offense had a horrible start to the game. They. The Tennessee's defense was doing a pretty good job of keeping Tennessee in the game, but their offense just was not producing consistently. Maybe not three and outs, but they were getting a first down and then leaving the field uh, after you know consecutive fourth downs. So their offense in the first half was was very poor, but then the second half they kind of woke up. Their first drive in the second half was a ten play seventy five yard touchdown drive that was capped off by thirty plus yard pass to Josh Palmer for a touchdown one of the better play designs that Tennessee's had this year. Um, and then uh, two drives later, they had another drive that stalled. Then two drives later, they have that 35, I believe, yard touchdown pass to Ty Chandler where he did make that cut inside, and then he was just kind of off to the races. So without those failed two-point conversions, you know, Tennessee had it 24-12. The offense after that uh, sputtered out a little bit. But again, Georgia took so much time off the clock that the offense – really uh, kind of had their door shut on opportunities. 
Yeah, and one thing I wanted to discuss was the offensive line. We, I know we've harped on that a lot uh, over the past few checkerboard chat episodes, but I think the offensive line showed some vast improvements against Georgia because that, that Georgia defensive front is easily the best front that Tennessee has faced this season. And honestly, the offensive line looked had one of their best performances of the season. So uh, you got to attribute that to, to maybe some coaching and practice, maybe those guys just getting more reps and feeling more comfortable. Um, but they, they definitely limited what Georgia did defensively. Georgia only had two sacks on Garantano, and Garantano is a guy that's been getting beat up the last few games. Right. Um, yeah, Tennessee's offensive line did a lot better job of protecting Garantano and even kind of making a little bit of a stride in the run game. Tennessee still kind of struggled to get a push in the run game, um, and that might be due to, to running backs missing cuts, but it was also the offensive line had a little bit of trouble blocking the run game. But pass blocking definitely saw a, a bigger increase, and one of those sacks on Garantano was just a completely missed blocking assignment. There was a little bit of confusion on the play between the center and the guard. And I believe it was uh, Walker on Georgia just came running right through and hit Garantano without a chance. So as a whole, the offensive line played a whole lot better. Who knows if it's a result of them practicing better or maybe they're starting to finally mesh because Tennessee has experimented a lot with their offensive line this year. But yesterday there wasn't a whole lot of change on the offensive line. So maybe Tennessee is starting to get a lineup and they're starting to run with it and they're going to mesh, which is what you want to do with an offensive line because it's such a it has to be a tight knit group because they have to work together in conjunction or you get missed assignments that end up getting your quarterback hit like yesterday. So we'll see if they continue to, to try to grow. Um, if Tennessee's offensive line can improve in their offense, I think could start being not explosive, but we see, we see what happens when Tennessee blocks. You get plays like Garantano had to Josh Palmer. Yeah, and one more thing I wanted to note before we wrap up the football conversation is Joe Doyle, who continued his, his good punting uh, to start the season, the redshirt freshman, he had uh, seven punts, and he's averaging over 40 yards a punt. He's leading the SEC in punts that are down inside the 20-yard line. So he's continuing to flip the field for Tennessee, which is something that when, you, when you're struggling in other positions, if you can flip the field position, then that's huge for, for your team. So if he can keep that up, then that's definitely uh, could be an X factor for Tennessee in games against Kentucky, Vanderbilt, South Carolina, Missouri, those kind of games, if those games that could be close down the end. Right, and Doyle has done a great job of stepping in and replacing the production that Tennessee lost in Trevor Daniel, who's kicking for the Texans now. It's funny because people like to joke that Tennessee is punter you, but it seems that every year they kind of cycle through punters that are pretty good because for Daniel you had Pilardi, and Doyle's kind of carrying on that tradition. He's done a great job so far this season. He kind of has that rugby-style punt that a lot of people talk about. Um, the pretty, he you know takes a few steps, can kick it low arcing, but he also has a great hang time. He allows his coverage to get down there. I don't think Tennessee has allowed a whole lot of punt return yards at all. Didn't allow even, a single return in yesterday's game. Yeah, and then even against Florida, they face Freddie Swain, who's one of the best returners, maybe not just the SEC, but in the nation. And I don't believe that they really allowed any return at all. So Tennessee's special teams right now is doing a great job, especially in the punt game. And it's, because, it's partially because of Joe Doyle is hanging those punts so high that it gives the coverage, but the Gunners are doing a pretty good job of getting down the field too. And then Doyle's just doing a great job of getting the punts either out of bounds inside the 10 or having it to where it can be down inside the 10. So you mentioned the special teams. It's probably the most underrated facet of football, but field position is a huge thing. And when you can flip the field, then when it comes to those more winnable games in the SEC East that Tennessee will face with your South Carolinas and your Vanderbilts and maybe even Kentucky and Missouri to an extent, then field position could play a huge factor. Yeah, and just to recap a few of the other sports that are happening around Tennessee right now, the volleyball team just a few minutes ago uh, picked up their third SEC win. That was another five-set win. So they have back-to-back five-set wins at Thompson Bowling Arena. Uh, they're now three and one in the SEC. And then the soccer team continuing to win, uh, to win matches there. They've only lost one match all season and they had a draw as well, but overall Penske's team is playing well and so is Iraq's team. Right, and Tennessee sports as a whole outside of football are doing pretty well right now. Men's golf is you know the top team in the country according to certain rankings. So Tennessee athletics as a whole are kind of on the rise and you mentioned volleyball at three and one in the SEC. I think Eve Rackham so far is kind of outperforming expectations in year one. I've said that before and I'll you know cons consistently say it because the volleyball team has never been one of the top shelf programs, but now she's got them on the verge of being in the top 25. She's got consecutive SEC wins against Missouri and then as you mentioned against Arkansas a minute ago. And then the soccer team as well is just kind of continuing its streak of performing well. They're, they've only got one loss in the SEC, and that's their single loss period. It was against South Carolina at home. 
So they had another shutout the other day. I think they're leading the SEC in shutouts, if I'm not mistaken. So they're doing a really great job so far. Yeah, and so as we kind of wrap this episode up, uh, next week is Tennessee's bye week for football. So we'll still have a checkerboard chat. I think we will have our soccer beat writers, Noah Taylor and Corey Sanding, on to talk a little more about soccer. Um, maybe we'll have our volleyball guys on in another episode down the road. But uh, for now, that's it for football. That's it for us. Thanks for watching.